Amen. Well, uh, my name is Pastor John, if you don't know who I am. This is just one of my favorite Sundays of the year. Uh, having our young people that are just following Jesus, uh, even more involved. Uh, a lot of them are involved throughout the year, but just getting them even more involved um, and being able to hear from them as they open the word this morning. It's always really, really special. And uh, just love, love our young people here at Northwest Chapel. And uh, this morning, it really is my privilege uh, to get to introduce to you uh, the two young men who are gonna be sharing with us. First, we're gonna have Gabe McGann and then Noah Carpenter. Uh, I know both of these guys well, uh, personally, they're friends, um, people that I've enjoyed sharing life with, doing life with, spending time with, uh, Gabe is pursuing his MDiv at Liberty uh, and is just doing great things, but most importantly, loves the Lord. <laughs> master of Divinity, sorry. Uh, his Master of Divinity at Liberty. And uh, Noah's at Ohio State. And again, both of them have been heavily involved in ministry. It's, it's amazing to see students, you know, as they transition from high school and then have an opportunity to kind of go their own way. Are they going to continue this pursuit of the Lord uh, or kind of get just caught up in some of the worldliness that's very easy to get caught up in uh, when you're really on your own for the first time? And both of these young men, as many of our young people here have, have just pursued after Jesus all the more so. So I'm excited. I know you guys are excited to just hear from the word from these guys this morning. Welcome them. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly thankful and humbled to be here. Um, I love this church. I love this family. Um, our generation likes to make up words. Um, so we have the Enneagram, which I think is from a long time ago, but we really adopted it as our generation. But we also have terms like that I was recently introduced to around a year ago called a thin space. And I haven't researched it much, and I don't know if it's from some heresy or something like that. but. <laughs> A thin space is how it was described to me was um, when you go, when you have an experience that just feels so beautiful and something that you just want to capture and just hold on to. And examples were like getting in your PJs and drinking hot cocoa next to a fireplace or something like that. And I, uh, although I feel that, I also definitely feel like my thin space is coming here. Um, whenever I'm on break, I, I love just being interrupted beautifully. Um, on my way to the chapel as I see the countdown and I'm not able to come in on time and I miss the first song um, just because people are stopping me. And so um, as a young adult, I am very thankful for this church and just being able to come here and feel so welcomed every single time I come back. Um, just a month ago uh, tomorrow, uh, my family went to Kentucky and had a memorial service for my grandmother. And uh, during that time, I thought about uh, Paul's letter to Timothy and how he encouraged him in the faith of having someone like Lois, his grandmother, and Eunice uh, being strong in the faith and raising them up in, in faith. And I, I was sad because I, I lost my Lois, but uh, I thought about how many other spiritual fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers I have here. And I'm just incredibly thankful to be teaching you and extremely humbled um, to be teaching you guys. Um, but, and what I can teach you from this passage, but if you will open up to uh, Mark 12, uh, 28 through 31, uh, in the Pew Bible, it's page 933, 933, and as you guys flip to it, I'm also extremely thankful to be sharing the stage with Noah this morning. Uh, Noah and I grew up together, we went to the same school, uh, same high school, and I remember in high school we went to a youth conference together, and someone's great idea was for us to be in the same room. And, uh, and someone else's great idea, Noah's, was to bring a harmonica to the room. And he only knew one song, and he practiced it day and night. Uh, he practiced, I think it was When the Saints Go Marching In. And uh, several times I wanted to throw that thing out the window. Sometimes I wanted to throw the harmonica as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm so glad God has sanctified us and matured us to be able to teach today. Uh, and I'm just really happy that I get to share the stage with my brother, Noah. 
Um, but yeah, let's read Mark 12, 38, or 28 through 31, uh, and I'll read, and you can follow along. One of the scribes approached when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well. He asked him, which command is the most important of all? This is the most important, Jesus answered. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time uh, where we can be together as a family, where we can enjoy the community that we have uh, under you and in Christ alone, God. I thank you for uh, just last week celebrating the coming of your son, uh, that God would be with us in the flesh as a baby. I pray that through that time we would also be reminded of the second advent when he comes back, when we would be together with you and together with all the saints before us. God, I thank you as we look forward to a new year and are reminded of the new creation that is prepared for us um, in the eschaton. I thank you for just the comfort of your love, that we can reflect on it, and because of your love, we are able to love you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so it's pretty undisputed that uh, you can look at all the news stations and they're telling us that we're just going further and further apart from one another. We're just disagreeing on more things and uh, whether the left hates the right or the right hates the left or Michigan hates Ohio State, Ohio State hates Michigan or Clemson. Um, <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, I'm also glad that it's 11 o'clock so everyone could sleep in and cry themselves to sleep. But uh, or you have books coming out called, uh, there's a book by Ben Sass, who's a senator from Nebraska called Them, because that's all we, we talk about them, or they don't like us. Uh, we just feel more separated from one another. And I think uh, this is almost most seen in the British Parliament. And I must confess, I'm addicted to YouTube. And so I'm addicted to two different kinds of YouTube videos. I love coffee videos, and I love watching the British Parliament. I don't know why. But the British Parliament architecturally is set up so that it would be benches in like stadium seating just facing each other. And so one, one party would be facing the other and they just sling insults at one another. And that's what they do for a job. And it seems very unfulfilling, but uh, I'm sorry if any of you are British parliamentary officials. I, but yes, uh, so they just go against each other and they're just, their job is to literally just spew insults to one another and somehow get legislation passed. And they just, there's hatred just at the center of it all. And so that kind of embodies this view of us against each other. And I think in this chapter, Jesus deals with two groups that were against each other, but were also against him in this case, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Earlier in this chapter, uh, Jesus talks to the Pharisees about where they stand within Caesar and under Caesar's rule. And then he talks to the Sadducees from verse 18 through 27 about um, the resurrection and who's going to be married to whom. And now he gets down to one of the scribes asking him and trying to stump him. So the passage we see goes to uh, one of the scribes approached when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him. We see this scribe wanting to stump the teacher. And he calls him teacher. He, it's a common strategy of students to stump the teacher. And uh, it's ironic because this is the all-knowing one and he's never gonna be wrong because he's perfect. And so I, I find it humorous that someone would try to stump Jesus, but also he didn't realize that he was Jesus. And the question was to stump him, what is the most important commandment in the whole scripture? And Jesus answers with, a very typical response, it's called the Shema, which in Hebrew means to listen, which is the first word in the, in the passage. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. And then it goes on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I think it's very important that all four of these are mentioned, and that it's not just love God and love others. And many will want to simplify it to that. And that's a great thing, and I, it makes great for uh, understanding what 
Jesus meant by this, but there's something profound about listing each of these particular points. We are to love God with our heart and soul. This is through our our devotion to him, through our salvation, through our sanctification, our justification, all these words to show how much we depend on him with our heart and soul and how we should be in full allegiance to him and him alone. But then it goes on to with your mind and with all your strength. And I think this is where many of us may get a little caught up. Um, One of my professors taught earlier this semester about the difference between thinkers and doers, which is a typical argument of philosophers back in the day was, oh, are, are we thinking beings or doing beings? And then one theologian and philosopher, St. Augustine of Hippo, um, he was from the third and fourth century, uh, he said, we're not thinkers or doers, we are primarily lovers. And I think this is so profound. This is exactly what Jesus is trying to say. We aren't to be primarily thinkers or brains or primarily bodies, but we are to be lovers, to love God with our mind and our strength. It is not just, not just one or the other, and we aren't primarily those. And so that's something that the Pharisees and the Sadducees missed. The Pharisees were so focused on obeying God and doing what God said that they missed the love aspect of loving God by doing those things. And the Sadducees were so focused on interpreting Scripture so thoroughly and so precisely that they missed the love that was promoted through God and spoken into the Scripture from God himself, how God loved him, loved the Sadducees. And so I think we need to really focus on us being lovers rather than doers or or thinkers. And we even do that today. We sometimes fill the parliament benches and look at ourselves as either primarily, primarily doers or thinkers, and we look at the other side and say, you know, they know a lot about God, but they do, do they do much? Or they do a lot, but do they even know who God is? But both are extremely important. For the individual, knowing God is so important. There's a pastor in Texas named Matt Chandler who talks about loving God through knowing who he is. Like a husband loves his wife, he knows who his wife is. He wants to know all the intricacies of who the, what the wife is as a person. Or, as my boss from this summer, loves Ohio State. And you could ask him, any player in the past 50 years, what high school they went to, how much they weighed, how tall they were, and he'll be able to answer. That's John Pappas, by the way. I was an intern here. So he, you can quiz him. I won't have him do it now, but you could quiz him at any point, and he'll know where they went to high school, what their mom's favorite food is, like all these things, because you know that he loves Ohio State. And that's unquestionable if you know him. And so to know, to love God is to also know him. But also to love God is to do works for him. If faith without works is dead, James tells us. And so we must obey the Great Commission, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. That is a doing act. That is something that we must go out and do. It's not something we can do from our desks or from our studies or from our library or something like that. We must go and do that. And I think I was encouraged recently. I was at a wedding last week, and I was with um, a friend, and we went to a coffee shop, and he was really frustrated because he didn't bring any Gideon Bibles with him. And I thought it was such such a beautiful imagery of someone who knows that he must be doing, knows that God has called him to evangelize to the nations, to Springfield, Missouri, or to Lynchburg, Virginia, where he's from. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see someone who is sold out on doing. And, and we must not identify ourselves as doers or thinkers, but still primarily go towards being lovers. And he does it so well. I think uh, if you're not a believer and you're listening to me ramble on being a lover, a thinker, or a doer, I think it's really important to understand that as Christians, we believe that God We are able to love God because he first loved us. It tells us that in scripture. And if you're not a believer, I hope you would understand that this perfect love that came to earth on Christmas Day is the one that sacrificed and loved us so much on the cross and that we would be able to love others well and love God well because of his sacrifice for us. But if you're an individual and you believe in God, I pray that you would be able to uh, understand that 
we should be seeking to love God in all these ways where we may be better, we may have a, a tendency to be a better doer or a better thinker, but instead we should also uh, see where our weaknesses are and desire to be lovers in doing and lovers in thinking. And so how do we do that within the church community is identify those who are really good at evangelizing. I remember uh, Ed Lewis, if you guys know him, he, he's a foul dude, but um, he'll, he'll tell you about how to fish for men and how to really go after men and do it and evangelize and tell us how to serve God well. And I just learned so much from someone who just does so often. And I learn and I glean from those who have taught us. And I think this comes through uh, finding service opportunities within the church and outside of the church. I know uh, in the youth group, we can have more leaders or we can have more teachers in Sunday school classes. That's a way to do and love God more through teaching others and knowing more about God. So doing both and combining. And so going back to the British Parliament imagery, we see these two having hate at the center and yelling at one another. Um, but I'd rather we look to the British choir as a way in for us to love better and how their ar architecture is set up. So in the Church of England, in like traditional churches, the choir is set up architecturally the same. They're set up in the same way that they would look at each other and sing praises to one another and encourage one another in song and in hymn and in psalms. I pray that we would be able to encourage one another by loving each other and facing one another. And even when we have these differences, being able to have love at the center between the pews instead of having hatred or yelling at one another. And, in, and I think that goes to show what Jesus is trying to say here. Um, yeah, I will pray us out. And then uh, Noah will come up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love that we can reflect on, which gives us strength, which gives us the ability to know more about you. I pray that we would continually love you more and desire that um, for those around us within our church family, uh, desire love to be at the center of all our conversations, for love to be um, the thing that drives us to reach the lost, uh, to be better citizens in the community, knowing that we are first and foremost citizens of the heavenly kingdom. God, that this is only a, temporarily, a temporary home. God, I pray that we would uh, love you by knowing the depths of who you are and continually wanting to strive to know you better. I pray that we would love each other with that same love and be motivated by that love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Noah, as John and Gabe said. Um, and just to start off, I'd like to say that after the summer I spent um, room with Gabe, it will conference, I was so discouraged by the feedback I received about my harmonica that I never picked it up again. <laughs> so there's my side. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, Pastor Rob asked me to just speak about what God has been challenging me um, in the recent months. And just as I looked over this last year, I realized that I've really learned a lot about forgiveness and just like what that looks like, whether relationally or with God. And so I thought I'd share a little bit about that. Um, I'm currently a junior at Ohio State. And so, yeah, last year as a sophomore, and just to dive into it, I'd say last year was one of the loneliest years of my life. Um, yeah, I just felt let down and failed by my friends closest to me. And just because of this lonely state I was in. Um, in addition to this, there were just a number of situations that left me feeling hurt and broken. And this just really developed into like an anger which led to bitterness and resentfulness. Um, and from this hurt, I blamed others and my view of just many things were just, was distorted. And so I really struggled with forgiving other people. Um, I wanted to forgive my friends and those that had hurt me, but, and I really wanted relief, but I just couldn't seem to find it. And so I really wanted to seek out a way um, to forgive others as God calls us to. And so just from my experience, I learned that there's like three major points 
that God teaches us about forgiveness. And one is just basking in God's forgiveness and what that is. And then from there, being empowered by the Holy Spirit to forgive others. And then lastly, forgiving ourselves. Um, so today I want to open up Psalm 103. Um, if you'd like to join me there and read verses 1 through 14. Um, before I read, I just want to give a quick background. This is a hymn of praise, and it celebrates God's goodness and love for his people. It recalls Israel's survival in time of Moses and how that was due to God's steadfast love. So if I start at verse 1, praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, so to anger abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. Now, these next verses I want to focus in on. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed and remembers that we are dust. So, if we're looking at verse 10, um, this is just where it really caught me. Um, it says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or pay us according to our iniquities. For our sins we are called to death, but we are forgiven. He brings us salvation. And I was just so in awe of that. And then verses 11 and 12, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And just what is so cool about this is that the east and the west, they never meet. When we're forgiven, God does not see us in our sin. Now, I was reading a book that reflected this idea, that God did not, or does not attach our achievements nor our sins to us. And I just sat in awe of that, basking in his forgiveness. He sees us and he loves us fully, not for what we've done, whether good or bad. I was talking with one of my housemates one night, just casual conversation about how God initiates with us. Um, in 1 John it says, we love because he first loved us. Revelation 3.20 says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to say hello and eat with him and he with me. We only know God because he chose to reach us. As the Bible says, he's omniscient. He knew every sin we would ever commit, every nasty, gross, disgusting way we'd further ourselves from him in rebellion. Yet he still chose to love us. He still chose to save us and to forgive us. And that's amazing. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's where I was just caught basking in God's forgiveness for us. Now, in the search of mine for righteous forgiveness, I came across Matthew 18, the parable of the ungrateful servant. Um, for time purposes, I'm just going to summarize this, um, but you can turn to it later if you enjoy. Uh, but after Peter asked Jesus how we should go about forgiving people, Jesus gives him this example of this servant who has a massive debt that's forgiven by the king. Now, the same servant, there's someone that owes him a small debt, and he finds himself unable to forgive that person and their debt. And because of this, that servant is tortured. Now, the theological implication of this is that God forgives all sins, so we should too. The king forgave him of every, um, all his debt. Yet when someone owed him debt, he was unable to forgive that. As I thought about this, I thought about how I str struggle with forgiving others in that same light. If we're called to love our enemies, what is stopping us from loving those that we care about? but sometimes hurt us. Friends and families that hurt us. For me, it was my friends. People that I'd shared life, memories, and struggles with. And I was convicted by this. Jesus says that loving those that love you should be easy, yet I found myself unable to do that. Then how was I supposed to love my enemies? 
One factor in learning all of this I found was humility. Not to put a situation over a person. I realized that I really needed to humble myself. When I was hurt by my friends, I wanted my own sense of justice, even if that meant hurting them in order to get even with how they made me feel. And that's sin. That's just evil. I had to recognize that this person I was angry at was also created by our creator, knit together in their mother's womb. This person I was angry at was a person with friends and family that loved them, a person with dreams, aspirations, struggles, insecurities, achievements, and failures. I realize that's how I'm supposed to see people, as God sees them. And what's so awesome is that we have the greatest example of humility and how Christ ultimately humbled himself. I always think of how God came to this earth as the word became flesh, and he looked his creation in the eyes, and they didn't recognize him. They hated him. They spit on him, and they murdered him. Jesus sat in the high throne of heaven since before the beginning of time and chose this awful, repulsive treatment from his own creation. And why? So that we might know his heart, so that we might be forgiven. So with all of this together, I learned a few practical things about how to forgive. Um, I learned that forgiveness is not necessarily feeling peace um, with the situation or person, but that forgiveness is a choice. And for me, that's why it was so hard. I wanted to feel right with it and then forgive. But God, God called me otherwise. I was listening to a sermon um, and about anger, and it listed these like practical steps, um, which I want to share with you right now. The first one was to overlook an offense if possible. For me, after being in such a broken position, there were a lot of small and frankly petty things that I got angry over. And I learned that I just needed to humble myself and let go. The second one is move quickly to forgive. I didn't want to sit in my negative emotions that were leading me to sin. The third one was to own my part in the situation before I went and called out the sin of another person and to ask for forgiveness for myself, whether I may have reacted or treated the person or sinful thoughts that I held against them. I learned that it's important to not focus on the motive of how someone has hurt you, um, but to bring to light the specific things and then how that makes you feel. The way of God is a way of great communication. And so, yeah, I learned a lot in that. And then lastly was to extend grace over and over. I had to realize that we were all broken and I couldn't hold people to standards that they weren't capable of holding. So yeah, just to summarize, just everything. Um, even when a person doesn't deserve it or when they haven't earned it, I learned just that true freedom comes from forgiveness, just as reflected by our relationship with Christ. When we're forgiven by God, he doesn't condemn us for who we truly are, and that is something that is so beautiful, brought to us by the gospel. I've grown so much in surrendering my emotions this semester to God and humbling myself before those that have hurt me. And what's so cool is that these friendships that hurt me once have been healed by choosing to pursue a righteous forgiveness for both others and myself. Lastly, I just want to say that Jesus empowers us to forgive others and ourselves in ways that we couldn't without him. And that's why he's God. If we were able to do everything that we could that he can on our own, we wouldn't need a God. But Christ brought Jesus down for us. And that's so beautiful. So if you could, just pray with me. Um, yeah. God, thank you for today. Thank you for life. Thank you for its challenges. Thank you that pain isn't wasted. We get to learn and grow and know you better through it, God. And I just am so thankful for that, God. I just pray that as we reflect, Lord, just that we would realize that we're forgiven. We're forgiven by you if we choose to be, God. If you reach out to us, it's our duty to react to that. It's our duty to lay ourselves down and see what you have to offer, God. So I just thank you for everyone that's made that choice in here. And Lord, I just thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to this earth to forgive us of our sins so that we will know you, so that we can have a relationship with you, God. I love you so much. Thank you for this day, and it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Would you stand and speak with us?